So here's the outline of my presentation. So first, I will address the context. Uh, next, I will present the uh, model problem of this uh, application, and after that, I will uh, quickly explain how the mimetic finite difference discretization works. And after that, I will uh, talk about the solver and preconditioning strategy. And finally, I will show some uh, numerical results and conclude. So, uh, in this work, we are mainly interested in uh, modeling the evolution of uh, force-free plasmas. And on long time scales, uh, such evolution is most efficiently described by a quasi-static uh, model that ignores the uh, plasma inertia. And the main uh, or the target uh, application is the uh, cold uh, vertical displacement event simulation of a major disruption in a, a neutral-like uh, tokamak. So this table here uh, explains the uh, notation used for the the various uh, unknowns and uh, constants that are involved in, uh, in, the, in this model. So uh, the, the fields that are colored in red are the ones that we will be using in the, in the final model. So we have the ion number density, we have the ion flow, we have the magnetic field, and we have the two components of the uh, electric field. Uh, so the uh, quasi-static uh, plasma dynamics model is a multi-domain model. Uh, so basically we have our computational domain that is uh, split into several subdomains uh, that have different uh, material properties. And we classify those subdomains depending on whether they contain plasma or not. So here I'm showing the uh, governing equations in the plasma region. So uh, equation number one expresses the ion density continuity. Uh, equations two, three, and four are the uh, plasma momentum, momentum equations. Uh, equation six is the generalized Ohm's law, which gives the electric field that is decomposed into uh, a divergence-free part, which is tau here, and a curl-free component, which is grad phi here. And finally, we have the uh, Faraday's law, which yields the magnetic field B. Then we have here on top, we have the uh, governing equations uh, for all the uh, other subdomains that do not contain plasma. So since there is no plasma, uh, the ion flow and the time derivative of the ion uh, density are just uh, equal to zero. And this simplifies the uh, Faraday's law and the Ohm's law, as you can see in equations 11 and 12. And uh, here we have the jump conditions, 13, 14, and 15, which should be naturally satisfied along the uh, wall and plasma interface, as they express that the ion flow, the tangential component of the tau field, and the normal component of the magnetic field are continuous across this interface. And finally, at the outer boundary, we have equations 16 and 17 that ensure that the electric field is zero. So uh, on the image uh, on the right, uh, we have the um, uh, ether uh, tokamak setting in the RZ plane. Uh, so during uh, a fusion reaction, uh, the plasma is confined inside a plasma chamber, which is uh, colored in orange and red here. And this chamber is protected by a blankets module that is colored in light gray. And the whole setting is surrounded by a vacuum vessel uh, that is uh, uh, colored in light blue. So uh, as a reminder, all these uh, different colors mean that all these areas have different mater material properties. Uh, particularly the resistivity that I, uh, I shown in the first table. Okay, so the next part of my talk focuses on the mimetic finite difference discretization. So the MFD employed here is a staggered mesh method. So that means that unknowns can be defined on different locations of the mesh. So uh, namely, we have vertices, we have uh, edge, face, and cell centers. So we use this uh, uh, notation of calligraphic N, calligraphic E, calligraphic F, and C for the uh, corresponding discrete spaces. And on the image on the right, we have an example of uh, a staggered uh, orthogonal mesh uh, where unknowns in EH are represented by those small squares here. 
So these are the uh, edge centers, unknown living on edge centers. And we have the unknowns in FH, uh, which are represented by arrows. And uh, to discretize PDEs, the MFD uh, builds up in three primary and three dual operators acting between the different uh, discrete spaces as illustrated in this discrete DRAM complex. And the major data structure that we build our algorithm up in is this DM stack, which is uh, Petsy's uh, distributed data structure for staggered grid representations. OK. Uh, First, we need to introduce uh, the uh, primary mimetic operators. So the MFD approximates first order operators using coordinate invariant formulas. So we just write the Stokes theorem for a finite size mesh object in one, two, and three dimensions. So the uh, formula on top right uh, gives the uh, definition of the primary gradient uh, uh, mimetic operator on uh, an edge center. So the edge that we are considering here is uh, denoted E. And on the, uh, on the bottom, we have the uh, definition of the primary uh, curl and the primary divergence operators uh, defined, on, uh, um, uh, defined on face centers and uh, cell centers, respectively. So. Uh, here you can, you, can, uh, you can see that there are some uh, alpha uh, coefficients here. These are just uh, orientation factors that are equal to plus or minus one. And note here that the magnetic field is represented by its uh, uh, normal uh, components to mesh faces, whereas the uh, vector field tau is represented by its tangential components on uh, mesh edges. So, all these three uh, discrete operators can be seen as rectangular matrices acting between the different uh, discrete spaces. So uh, that's for the primary mimetic operator. So now let's see how derived mimetic operators are defined. So uh, here to, uh, to simplify the presentation, we just consider uh, Green's formulas on functional spaces where the boundary integrals are equal to zero. So we have the three uh, formulas on top uh, from which we can deduce a set of dual operators uh, with respect to the primary operator. So uh, uh, the duality is with respect to the L2 product. So here we have, for example, minus gradient in duality with divergence, minus divergence in duality with gradient, and finally the curl in duality with itself. So uh, a set of derived mimetic operators can be defined by discrete analogs of these uh, Green's formulas to preserve the duality property with respect to the primary mimetic operators uh, defined previously. So for instance, we have the uh, uh, derived divergence uh, mimetic operator uh, that is in duality with minus the primary mimetic uh, gradient operator. So it would have input uh, from the edge, uh, discrete edge space and it would have output in the discrete uh, vertex space. So uh, here it is uh, relevant to point out that the uh, mimetic operators satisfy these uh, discrete identities on the primary level, as shown in equations 18 and 19, but also at the derived level uh, on equations 20 and 21. And uh, furthermore, when the, uh, uh, so, when we discretize the Faraday's law using the primary uh, divergence mimetic operator, uh, we get this interesting uh, property that states that if the magnetic field is initially divergence free, it will remain so for the subsequent time steps. So this is a direct consequence of the discrete uh, identity uh, 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 div curl is equal to zero on the discrete level. OK, so now I'm going to talk about the solver and the preconditioning strategy. So uh, note that the Jacobian matrix corresponding to the uh, uh, quasi-static plasma dynamics model takes this shape shown here in equation 22. And here we, were, we just used the continuous operators uh, to simplify the presentation. And C1 and C2 blocks uh, express the dependency between the magnetic field 
and the ion flow in the plasma momentum equation. So their formulas differ uh, whether or not we are, uh, we are uh, uh, focusing on the subdomains with plasma or subdomains without plasma. Uh, so at the most outer level, uh, we use a nonlinear solver that is based on Jacobian free Newton Krylov uh, and inexact Newton. Uh, whereas for the uh, inner uh, linear systems, uh, we need to uh, compute a, a finite difference approximation of the Jacobian uh, with coloring uh, that serves for the uh, as a preconditioner for the Jacobian matrix in inversion. So here relying on this approximated Jacobian turns out to be necessary because the mimetic formulations uh, involve many projections between different uh, discrete spaces and uh, implementing an analytical Jacobian for uh, such a complicated system is cumbersome. So that's why we rely on this uh, uh, approximated uh, Jacobian. And uh, so uh, for the linear systems resulting from the linearization of the PDE, uh, uh, we use uh, a flexible gemrest that is solved, uh, um, uh, that is preconditioned by a four level block preconditioner that uses uh, PETC's uh, field split interface. And this preconditioning strategy was inspired from uh, a recent uh, coupled preconditioning work by Matt Nipley and uh, some, uh, and his co authors. So uh, here at the first level, what we do is that we're trying to check the Jacobian formula and take advantage of all these uh, zero subblocks um, here. So um, we build uh, uh, a, so we split the uh, ion density from the other fields and we build this multiplicative uh, uh, field split preconditioner given in equation 23. Uh, so here, KSP stands for the uh, uh, PETC's uh, package for linear system solvers, uh, including uh, direct and iterative, uh, sequential and parallel. So uh, KSPJN means that in order to apply the inverse of JN, an inner solver will be called uh, on the subsystems involving this uh, unknown NI. So this means that this uh, equation 23 is, a, is an exact factorization, provided that we can invert J and I and this other block J tau phi BV exactly. So in our preconditioner, we just use a JMRS solver preconditioned with a block Jacobi for the uh, subsystems involving NI. And uh, for the remaining uh, bottom right block, we use a, a flexible JMRS solver. So now the problem gets converted to looking for an efficient preconditioner for this J tau phi BV, which is the second level of our uh, block preconditioner. So at the second level, uh, we split the uh, tau uh, field from the other fields, and we build this preconditioner uh, in equation 25 that is based on the conventional sure complement. So, uh, uh, one thing to, to note here is that this J tau can be trivially inverted because it's just equal to an identity matrix as shown here. So the advantage of that is that the sure complement S phi BV can be exactly formed just through matrix multiplication. And this uh, sure complement is given in equation 26. Once again, when we check this sure complement, we see that there are some uh, zero blocks on the uh, bottom left of diagonal part of this matrix. And this uh, is a direct consequence of the discrete identity that says that the curl of the grad is equal to zero at the discrete level up to machine precision. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take advantage of the same uh, block upper triangular shape of the sure complement to build uh, another multiplicative preconditioner at the third level that is given in equation 27. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, so here this is very similar to what we did at the first level. So it's another multiplicative preconditioner. Um, and for the two remaining uh, blocks of the uh, fourth level, which are this J phi and this S here that contains only the magnetic field and the ion flow. So we're going to use 
uh, uh, GEMRES preconditioned with uh, Boomer AMG preconditioner from the hyper package for J5 because this J5 is just equal to a Laplacian. So we know that Boomer AMG works, uh, works very well for this kind of problems. And then at the, uh, on the other, for the other block, we, we will be using a, a direct solver, which is a super LU dist uh, for this uh, sure complement that contains only the B and the VN node. So here I will outline some advantages of the proposed preconditioning strategy. So first we know that except for the JNI and J5 subsystems, the factorization and the solver strategy is exact. So this is an outcome of the proposed preconditioning strategy, but also of the um, uh, properties of the mimetic operators. And here the solver for J5 is scalable due to algebraic multigrid being used. The uh, problematic part here is that uh, we notice that uh, there is uh, the coupling between the magnetic field and the ion flow in the last sure complement is non-conventional. So we find that there is a strong off-diagonal coupling uh, in this uh, last uh, uh, two by two block. And as a consequence, most of the computational time uh, comes from the inversion of this last sure complement, as we can show in this flame graph below. So here we can see that the super LU factorization of this last uh, sure complement is the uh, dominating function in the global system's uh, linear solve. And overall, the uh, nonlinear solver and the preconditioner seem to perform uh, well, uh, so the, um, uh, the typical wall clock time to take a single time step is uh, around half a minute on 128 CPUs. Uh, so to assess the performance of our solver in solving the quasi-static plasma dynamics model, we ran some simulations on NERSC's ma NERSC machines, so Cori and Perlmutter, using 128 CPUs uh, uh, on both. And for time integration, we just use this second order L-stable Dirk time integrator from uh, Petsy's TS library for time integration. So all the simulations are run on a cylindrical mesh that has uh, a resolution of 100 grid points in the R direction, uh, two grid points uh, with periodic boundary condition in the phi direction, and 200 grid points in the Z direction. So here, a minimal number of grid points was taken in the phi direction because in this work, we're just considering the axis symmetric case. And finally, we have the following resistivity values for the different uh, uh, subdomains uh, in our computational domain. So uh, here I am showing the results of a full ITER VDE simulation. So uh, this animation here shows the uh, toroidal current uh, uh, over time and also the magnetic field. So the toroidal current is represented by this color map here to the right. And uh, what we see in this animation is that the toroidal current uh, gets uh, progressively dissipated inside uh, the plasma chamber. So that explains the uh, appearance of uh, some current on, uh, inside the vacuum vessel. So the magnetic field here is represented as streamlines and the, um, uh, the magnetic axis, which is the O point of these streamlines, will be moving uh, progressively upwards until it hits this uh, blankets module. And when it does, the toroidal current uh, inside the plasma chamber would get almost entirely dissipated. So this is the VDE phenomenon. So the same simulation were, uh, was used to investigate the divergence-free property of the magnetic field uh, in the uh, MFD solver. So here, I, this graph is showing the evolution of the infinity norm of the divergence of the magnetic field over time. So uh, we can see that initially the divergence of the magnetic field is not exactly zero, but it's rather close to the order of 10 to the power minus 10. But um, as time evolves, uh, the divergence fluctuates by plus or minus 10 to the power minus 15, 
which confirms the divergence-free property that, we, uh, that I stated previously. And the next step in assessing the performance of our solver was to uh, vary the plasma resistivity value in each simulation and check how the uh, uh, solver uh, performs. So the time step is always fixed depending on the plasma resistivity such that it is always equal to 1% of the characteristic resistive time that is given by this formula here where A is the minor radius of the tokamak. And we run simulations for 70 time steps, uh, which is uh, enough to uh, observe the VDE phenomenon. And then we uh, report the average number of linear and nonlinear uh, uh, iterations uh, over the entire simulation. So that's what we have in this table here. So it is found that the number of nonlinear iterations per solve seems to be stable around four whereas the uh, linear system seems to require slightly more iterations for lower, uh, lower resistivities. So the case of lower resistivities are, uh, the cases with lower resistivities are the most challenging ones. But uh, here we observe that the increase uh, remains uh, reasonable, so I think it's, uh, uh, it's around two iterations for the resistivity range that we tested uh, um, in this application. So overall, we can say that the performance of this solver is more or less uh, independent of the value of the resistivity that we considered inside the plasma. So here I am showing a quick overview uh, of the number of iterations needed for the inner systems. So we can see that this, this solver uh, does not, the inner solves do not need many iterations, so it's at most uh, five iterations. Um, yeah, and so in concluding this presentation, it is uh, helpful to recall that the MFD discretization ensures that the magnetic field is divergence-free up to machine precision, and that was uh, verified by the uh, numerical uh, tests. And the algorithm uh, performance shows that the uh, preconditioner and the nonlinear solver perform uh, well because we got uh, low numbers of iterations. And the solver also allows uh, uh, large time steps and deals with very small uh, resistivities in a fast runtime. And for uh, future work perspectives, we're working on replacing the, uh, the uh, sub-block solver uh, by a more scalable option than just super LU, and also adding more unknowns to the, to the model. So namely, we would like to add, for example, the parallel ion velocity, the ion temperature, and the electron temperature. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Zach. Oh, we've got a question already. So it is more of a curiosity than an actual question. So can you list the options for the solver? The How options? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I would like to see, you know, the, you know. I mean, I thought field split, field split. Field split with field split with field split. In okay, yes. let me see how I can. Uh, I don't think I have it on the slides, but I can uh, no, I can speed. find it online. Like if I I can show you the archive, uh, the article on archive, and show you the yeah, it's a long one. We should add this as some sort of robustness stress test for field splits. See how many times we can nest it inside itself. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Um, the duality is based on these grid-based inner products, right? Mm -hmm. um, in your cylindrical form, does that um, cylindrical coordinate end up changing the weights of the uh, inner product or is it treated, I guess, is it treated like a, a constant thickness slice? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and are your dual uh, uh, derivative co-derivative operators, are they still sparse? I guess that's a quantity of yes, the... Yes, of they the, are still sparse. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. One quick question. I'll help make the next speaker get set up while we do that. It seems like if this works 
You could also try um, picking out those same blocks as patches and then mm -hmm. doing like the more local patch saws and that m could work as a smoother uh, mm -hmm. for this thing because you can get, st DM Stag will do the, the coarsening automatically so you could like smooth like that, rediscretize and see if that works. It seems like it ought to because there's nothing weird coupling parts of the domain. Mm -hmm. It would be neat to try. Uh, yeah, okay, well, uh, thanks for the suggestion. I think we'll, uh, we'll try to explore this, uh, this possibility. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's thank that one more time.